Half Forgotten History is presented by State Farm. Getting great car or home insurance from State Farm at a surprisingly great rate? Well, that's just like talking to biggest names in NFL history and hearing their untold stories. It's the real deal. So choose insurance that always brings its A-game. When you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. You know, here in the East Coast, and quite frankly across the country, McDonald's just isn't this large global restaurant. It's a local one too. Much in the same way these Hall of Fame athletes that you see me talking to are also people that live and work in the communities and towns where they are. McDonald's are owned and operated by people that live in those communities. And when you eat at a McDonald's, you're supporting a local business. You might even be supporting your neighbor's business. And McDonald's franchises also care about the communities that they're in. That's why they give back to the local Ronald McDonald chapter houses and why they help first responders, like when they gave hot, fresh meals to those out there fighting the devastation of Hurricane Laura. When you own a McDonald's, you are committed to serving the community where you do business. McDonald's, serving here. He says to me, how many sports centers have you done? At least one? And I'm like, yeah, I have. He goes, fuck it, sign them all. <laughs> <laughs> hey everybody, Trey Wingo here. Glad you're with us for another episode of Half Forgotten History. Now, if you follow the show at all, you know the premise, sit down, cocktail, talk great stories with NFL legends. But NFL legends can be used many different ways. And this is what we're calling a bonus episode of Half Forgotten History because he's a legend in the NFL in his own right, in his own way. Uh, my former coworker at ESPN and, and now the longtime face of the NFL Network, you see him on Sunday mornings, you see him everywhere, and also on the Rich Eisen Show, richeisenshow.com, appropriately named Rich Eisen, now joins us on Half Forgotten History. How are you, pal? How are you, Trey? I appreciate that invitation. Um, and. Normally, um, everywhere I go, I'm considered a bonus. So this, um, <laughs> this is this fits. This is it dovetails. It dovetails. You know, you you were you were kind enough to have me on your show about a week ago, and we were just chopping it up about a bunch of different things. And you said something to me that literally floored me, and, and I guess it shouldn't have, but it just it just didn't register in my brain that way. You're like, yeah, you know, I was only at ESPN for seven years, and you've yeah. been at network for what 17 15 something Eight, like that 18 18 it just it just seems so strange to me having you know watched you before i got there by a year at espn and then worked with you for four or five years at espn that you were only there for seven years it just i don't know time is a flat circle i guess but when you said that it kind of freaked me out that you had only been there that long yeah i got there in 96 february of 96 they hired me out of redding california um, which is uh, low, it's a, you know, I think it's like market 120 something out of 200 or what have you. And I, I, I was kind of the original, you know, dream job winner um, where they just plucked me from a small market and put me right on Sports Center. And yeah, 2000, May, May of 2003 was my last show there. Um, and that was the end of that. But maybe people think I was there longer because the show that I did with Stuart re-aired nine times so i might have gotten like <laughs> double the exposure that somebody would normally be there for seven years you know back in the day the old 2 a.m then 1 a.m was aired from Correct. 5 a.m all the way to one in the afternoon so yeah it, it, but it's just it just i don't know why it just seems strange to me because i always thought of you as a fixture there and for you to only have been there you know seven plus years i don't know it, ju it just seemed weird to me and as we're taping this show it's right around the anniversary of stewart's passing a and you mentioned stewart and i think we would be remiss if we didn't just sort of uh have a little conversation about how much fun it was to to work with him and be with him and like i, I was out on your show in last summer in la when you know you could actually do face-to-face -face things and and it was right around his birthday and, you know, I was never as close to Stuart as you were. I didn't work with him nearly as much as you did. But I always told that story that one time we went down for ESPN the weekend at Disney World and we got there a day early and we we're like, well, shit, let's go play golf. And we hadn't really hung out that much, but it was just the two of us down there. And we had the best time and we were terrible golfers, but we were really good at flagging the golf cart and uh, the, the cart girl. And she came over and took care of us on more than one occasion. And I always, I always tell this story. It's like, we all, we got back and said, Hey, you know, we should really do that again. We should absolutely do that again. And we never got around to it. And then he got busy. I got busy. Then he got sick and we never played that round of golf again. And I always say, when you have the time, take the time because 
what I wouldn't give to, to have a day like that with Stuart on the golf course one more time. You I know, agree. Now it's not possible. I know how you feel. Like, you know, there's so many amazing things about Stuart that uh, leap to mind just when you were telling that story. And uh, I, I think that um, he had, he might have led the league in people would say, let's do that again after they hang out with him. And obviously, as you know, uh, never made it to his 50th birthday. And um, his days were cut short. But um, I, I, I've met few people who could hold a candle to him in terms of um, seizing the day, living every moment that it, that it was worthwhile living for. And, you know, his enthusiasm and his uh, was childlike. And his energy was unrivaled, just un, unrivaled. Guy couldn't really sit still sometimes. And, um, you know, and it was just uh, amazing, you know, to be able to sit next to him and watch him uh, evolve as a broadcaster and um, not knowing at the time that he was preparing me to be a girl dad, you know, um, watching the way that he would be around his two, his two ladies, Tay and Sid. And I had no idea that, you know, I'd be having moments with my daughter, Taylor, as well. I mean, his Taylor was spelled differently, but, um, you know, that, that my daughter, Taylor, and I would be spending moments, and I'd catch myself with these sweet moments I have with my daughter, um, and, and it would just flash back to me seeing Stuart with his girls. And it's just, you know, it's amazing, you know, when, when, um, when um, you got me thinking here now, man. When when uh, when Dan and Keith reunited on Sports Center, I think it was last year, actually. Yeah. And um, so many, you know, obviously I'm such a huge fan of theirs, and them doing the big show in Sports Center made Sports Center at night what what it was when I first arrived, and obviously Kilborn with the Feel Good Edition and all that, and um, you know, as a 26 year old walking in the building in 1996. It was huge and getting to work with both of them was amazing and being able to call both of them friends to this day is is beyond rewarding so watching them back together again i got so many texts because you know they they didn't tell anybody they didn't even tell me just kind of showed up and surprised and um i couldn't watch it so many people are like are you watching i'm like no i can't um and the reason why is i know i can't have my reunion show yeah that's a fact. Yeah. You know, it really hit me that, you know, I would, what I wouldn't, you said, give to play another round with him or whatever. Um, I would give to do one more show with him. It's, um, it's a fact. Um, now, let me ask you a question here, Trey. I'm sorry. Sure. I'm steering it in a different direction here, but I'll, I'll do it. Did, uh, did Stuart cheat on that day playing golf? Because, <laughs> um, well, I remember listen. all my rounds with Stuart, you know, I mean, we, we could say the best stick in his bag was the one with the eraser at the end of it. Um, well, you know, times, we, you know, I, a couple times he would just launch one into, you know, a white steak area and drop it like it was a red steak situation. And um, we had to call him out on it many times. So I'm wondering if you had that experience. I, I think it, I think it would be safe to say that we were both uh, – very well uh lubricated it, yes <laughs> without question and on more than one occasion we used a hand wedge instead of a sand wedge uh, I, I think I, that i imagine so yes live with okay. this way we were going for maximum fun and not maximum rule enforcement that day so yeah it was but it was good like we we literally by the time we got the 18th hole, we're like i don't even know what's happening anymore but it was just a blast it was just great and uh, yeah, i mean one time like he literally launched it oh yeah right, I mean, you remember James Brown sure. uh, of ESPN? He Absolutely. In, uh, Legend. That guy had the greatest job for so Ever. many. All he did was go to sporting events and wine and dine clients. Like JB was, was the amazing. ultimate right. entertainer. He was, you know, he was Hugh Jackman before the movie came out. So JB would say to me, he would play golf. Stuart and I would play golf a lot with JB on a lot of these boondoggles that we were fortunate to go on. And JB said to me one day before we play, he goes, we have to tell Stewart today 
that he cannot just do whatever he wants with the golf ball on the course. Like we'll, we'll call it the mediocre masters that, that there is a <laughs> green jacket at the end that we have to treat this like it's a major, it's our major. I'm like, whatever you want to do, uh, James, because I don't think he's going to do it. So sure enough, we peg, we peg it up. Might've been in Orlando actually. And uh, where, you know, he's a legend. There were so many different places where he was a legend because he used to work there. Um, and so uh, he launches one way out to the right, okay? And God bless Stuart, you know, his eyesight was, was uh, substandard uh, to begin with. And him looking for a ball was just the worst thing ever. So I'm like, Stuart, just drop one, okay? Just drop one, just go ahead. And, um, and so this time though, it was the day where we decided mediocre masters and it was a white stake. Like he technically had to go back and re-tee and, um, <laughs> and he just says, who made this rule up anyway? Literally what he said, <laughs> like, how long has this been in the rule book? And I'm like, since yeah. Braveheart, since yeah. like yeah. literally, you know, since- Since sheep manicured the fairway at the old correct. course. Correct, yeah. you know, yeah. so, but God bless, just so many amazing memories uh, with him, alongside him, professionally, personally, I mean, my wife, um, worked there. I met Susie, uh, my wife, Susie Schuster at ESPN. We were just friends. I wanted to be more than such. Stuart played both of us to the middle quite a bit. Um, and the day we got married, you know, Stuart was at the wedding and there's an amazing photograph in our, in our album of him, you know, holding my hand and pointing to the ring with a big smile on his face. And, you know, anybody who would look at this photograph would say, oh, there's a, a friend who's, who's happy, you know, for his friend getting married. But Stuart, uh, the caption of that is, we did it, you know? <laughs> well, okay, that, that is so Stuart, because- we, we did, Rich, we did it. You know? yeah. <laughs> do, do you remember, I, I, you might have been on the show with him when this happened. We were, I, we was, I don't know if it was the first time Jordan retired or the second time Jordan retired as a member of the right. Wizards. I can't remember what it was, but everyone was asking about their favorite Michael Jordan moment, you know? Right. And Stuart, true to what you were saying, wasn't didn't think about the shot against Craig Elo or, you know, the three-pointers against the Blazers in the finals that year, the sixth championship, whatever. Without hesitating, Stuart said, uh, you know, back at North Carolina alumni game, we're all playing. I'm on the same team with Michael. He passes me the ball. I make the shot. He points to me, and I was like, validation. And he's just, <laughs> you know, the Stuart Michael Jordan moment was when Michael passed Stuart the ball, and yeah. he scored the bucket. I, I, but, you know, just for anybody who might be surfing in right now, though, I mean, he literally would give you the shirt off his back. No and question. The number of no times question. that I he would meet people just literally – right away, whether it's at a bar in a social setting or at ESPN when someone's coming through on a tour or a friend of somebody who would just walk up, he literally would make that person feel like they were the only one in the room. And um, just, you know, I could, I could literally go on and on for real. Yeah, and, and, and to that point, I'll tell this one story, we'll move on to something else, but I was a little, in a little bit of a kerfuffle when I first arrived yes. at ESPN yes. because they, there was a story. Yeah. Oh, I, I, everyone did. The fame, towel. Uh, the fame towel. Yeah. There was a quote taken out of context. I won't go into it. His name is Dan Caesar. Um, that just sort of bagged me in this article. And it, long story short, there was a line that said, I hope not to be the towel boy too long. Well, everyone was furious about that. Well, Jay, so they yeah, literally more than anybody. He was without the, Jay. He, that he is the Jay Jack's way. No question. So they, they actually got a towel and they all signed it and these snarky little comments, you know, in by five, whatever, blah, 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 blah. The only thing Stuart put on the towel was welcome. That was, that was, that was the only thing he was going to do. And uh, I, I always, uh, did I ever tell you, I always, I've, I've already that. heard your curse. So I'll tell this story about Berman welcoming yeah. me. Did I ever tell you this story? No, oh. but I, this is probably going to be about good. the banners. Did I ever tell you this one? You know, cause so, no. um, Everyone who has seen uh, an ESPN event has seen, certainly in baseball games or whatever, they would always have yet the ESPN banner uh, draped on the side, like bunting, right, uh, of the first baseline or third baseline or behind home plate or what have you. So it, everyone knows it's an ESPN broadcast. It was their way of branding the game that they're covering. So as you know, Trey, um, so many people in the building would hang these banners in the hallways, uh, resting Correct. on the prefabricated walls of all the cubicles, and it would create like this walkway down 
down an office setting, banner row, banner row yeah. and people would hang them and with a note saying, hey, this is for such and such a charity. Would you please sign? Talent, please, on-air people, please sign. And I'm wide-eyed when I'm walking in, like everybody who I've been watching on Sports Center. I mean, this the, the six o'clock Eastern Sports Center was Bob Lee, Robin Roberts, and Charlie Steiner, and the eleven was Dan and Keith, and you know, I mean, so I just oh, so on and so forth. So I literally thought to myself, like, you know, when am I allowed to sign these banners? I had the exact right? same like, thoughts. At what so point funny. am I allowed to sign? The last thing I want to do is sign the banner, and people are like kid's been here three days and he's just like, I mean, I felt, you know, really self-conscious about it. So I'm doing a 7.30 or 7 p.m. Sunday sports center, the show time that doesn't exist anymore, but um, baseball tonight is on either after or before me, either one, I don't remember, but the point of it is, is the guy who's sitting in the makeup chair before me is Chris Berman. So what I, I said to him, I told him this whole story and I figured who better to ask than you. I mean, if you say, you know, it's good, then I'm good to go. Papal blessing. So he says to me, how many sports centers have you done? At least one. And I'm like, yeah, I have. He goes, fuck it. Sign them all. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> okay, and I grabbed the Sharpie and I went right down the line, not feeling yeah. it, I'm second thought about it. That's but that's so, that's so true because that, like, after a couple of sports centers and I'd been there, I was like, okay, I'll sign. And I'll never forget, I walked by this one and I realized I had signed it twice. And I was like, oh no, some, I'm the new guy. They hated me already. And now I'm some, I've signed this bit. Like, what the fuck yeah. is wrong with you? You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I was like, Please, God, take that banner down before anybody sees it. Right. But you mentioned Boomer. Like, outside of the towel thing, the first day at ESPN, I ran into Boomer in, of all places, the bathroom. And he had been to St. Louis, where I'd come from, a bunch of times, you know, to do Cardinal games and all that kind of stuff. And I ran into him in the bathroom. I said, Chris, you may not remember. My name's Trey Wingo. I met you at Bush Stadium. And he actually said, Cheddar Smokies, Bush Stadium. You were the one to tell me. So like, he remembered that I told him to try the cheese-infused hot dog at Bush Stadium. And that was like, oh, my God, Berman knows who I am. What was your, what was your nickname? Uh, from Boomer? Hal C. Hal C. Oh, so he didn't, he didn't, Hal C. Wingo? Like, is it yeah, just Hal C. He, al he also called me Counter Trey for the old Redskins That's running play. Counter, Counter Trey, Trey Wingo. Counter I had Trey. Two. I had two, okay? Yeah. I had Rich Betty Davis Eisen, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite one was Rich Kaleidoscope Eisen. I'm like, <laughs> Kaleidoscope? Yeah, from uh, from uh, the uh, the Beatles song. The, oh, all right. I got you. I got you. Lucy in no. the Sky with Diamonds, you know, with exactly. Kaleidoscope, Kaleidoscope Eisen. Eisen. I yes. got you. I got I you. I thought that was a little bit subversive. I, I, you know, I'm like, hey, I got a Berman nickname. I'm here. And he told me to sign yeah. him off. I'll never forget. That was his response. It was just like, I am here. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I made it, you know? Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was absolutely great. And uh, yeah, Counter Trey was the one he always referred to me as. By the way, every year before the draft, he would send me the same text. Don't bleep it up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just, oh, that was no. it. Just don't bleep it up. I got another one. I got, I got the other one because, you know, I, I wound up, you know, competing. I mean, again, the, the, the executive who basically – brought the NFL platform to ESPN and he was the face of it and you know uh countdown and just name I don't need to obviously he is the legend of it and uh was Steve Bornstein who left and started NFL Network and hired me to start it and so he put me in all these positions to essentially compete I mean I did I, I the draft for years looking over you know, I'm probably dating myself like that, you know, uh, Looney Tunes cartoon with, uh, you know, Wile E. Coyote and, uh, and Ralph the dog with it. They would be in different, you know, different forts like over in Radio yeah. City Music Hall. That was the ESPN fort that you sat on. And, you know, and then I had my fort on the right side of the of the of the mezzanine. And, you know, and so I was competing with him. And um, he, he told me that day, the same thing he also told me 
um, the year that he inducted Ralph Wilson. He introduced yeah. Ralph Wilson for the Absolutely. Pro Football Hall of Fame. And now it's done by videotape, but back in that day, you actually gave a speech. So that year he couldn't host, he couldn't MC the entire thing. I, that's the one year that I've MC'd the Hall of Fame because Chris couldn't host and introduce one. Although he would have wanted to. Probably so. But at any rate, he told me on that day, the same thing he told me at the first draft, which was don't be too good. Yeah. <laughs> this is what he said. <laughs> <laughs> he leaned into me, don't be too good. It's what he said to me. Uh, that's oh, funny. my gosh. You, you mentioned the draft, and, and we had a tradition every year that I did the draft and you did the draft, that we would take our picture before yes. the draft. Because right. at the end of the day, no matter what happens, we're friends first, and that was a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. And I hated, I hated this year that we didn't get to take that picture. Yeah, because yeah. it was such a it was such a effed up situation and, and people don't understand this and it, it was a big part of the people at nfl network as much as it was the people at espn you know we had that set up in las vegas 53 days before the day it was all set everything was ready to go and in less than two months the world changed dramatically and all of that had to be pulled together the way it was pulled together this year for the draft and I just don't think people really understood or still don't understand how many people had to work so tirelessly behind the scenes to put that thing together logistically. It was, a, it, it was an impossible ask. And I, especially in the light of the times of people wondering why, why it was being done at all. You know, and, um, and as it turned out, you know, you hosted it and I did the hosting of a Zoom sort of charitable marathon draft a thon a draft a thon yeah. right yeah so yeah. it kind of all worked out because that thing raised a ton of money which and was then, awesome and then the the draft coverage was through the roof and i'll tell you what i, I mean um it's something nobody ever wants to do again ever correct correct um certainly under these circumstances but i i, I think um coaches and gms kind of digged being home oh, i think absolutely. they kind of they kind of love just doing it from home and fans could not get enough of all the draft settings like, you know, uh, the uh, um, Andy Reid, you know, office setting or uh, Matt Nagy's play sheet down, downstairs basement with all the right. play sheets Belichick, filling up the oh, family room. Belichick's yeah. dog in his Nantucket kitchen, you know, or you know, obviously, uh, Mike Vrabel's Blue Man Group type circus, Cirque du Soleil that was going That was out. insane. That and, was insane. But number one was uh, Cliff Kingsbury. Like, he was in a Bulgari ad like James Bond and loafers and no socks, and he's got the fire on in the backyard. And when it's 110 outside, by the way. He was the I only know. person in the entire right. state of Arizona with a fire pit working that and day, let's be honest. Opposite of Dave Gettleman with one laptop and uh, yeah. and one thing plugged in the wall. And I, I think it was just an amazing event that um, nobody ever wants to do again. And then in terms of, you know, We'll be on the other side of this thing, man. And at some point that's coming. And like the last pandemic that we had, Trey, um, there was the roaring 20s after it. Yeah. And I think we're about to get ours, you know, knock on wood. And Vegas will get the draft and it'll be lit and people will be back. And um, the fact that we're, you know, where we're talking right now, so many weeks into the season, um, you know, it's not even something I want to talk about out loud. It's just been amazing. And the, the, the Herculean effort of everybody, um, you know, not uh, obviously we're just talking about one weekend of television. Um, yeah. It's been amazing. The whole thing's been amazing, but nobody ever wants to do it again. That's for sure. No. And, and listen, I, I just, I, I hated the fact that we didn't get to take that picture this year. And I just, I just, well, here to we are on, on your pod. We're doing it. Right? We're doing yes. it this way, brother. That's we're it. doing it this way. Uh, finger pistols. We'll do it that way. Uh, all right. Let's, let's take a little break. We'll fill our glass. When we come back, we'll talk about this thing called the NFL and how it's still going strong. Stay with us. You know, here in the East Coast, and quite frankly, across the country, McDonald's just isn't this large global restaurant. It's a local one, too. Much in the same way, these Hall of Fame athletes that you see me talking to are also people that live and work in the communities and towns where they are. McDonald's are owned and operated by people that live in those communities. And when you eat at a McDonald's, you're supporting a local business. You might even be supporting your neighbor's business. And McDonald's franchises also care about the communities that they're in. That's why they give back to the local Ronald McDonald chapter houses and why they help first responders, like when they gave hot, fresh meals 
to those out there fighting the devastation of Hurricane Laura. When you own a McDonald's, you are committed to serving the community where you do business. McDonald's, serving here. All right, uh, back on this bonus edition of Half Forgotten History with uh, my longtime friend, Rich Eisen. By the way, we got to see the shirt here. I, yeah. I had the, yeah, let's, let's uh, this take is a look. The, this is a game day morning special, an NFL game day morning special, um, where Michael Irvin's remarkable, famous speech when he went to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, where he was teary-eyed, and it's still one of the top five speeches in the history of the Hall of Fame. Uh, the Cowboys performing as they have uh, in recent days, and this is not just this year, we're talking about um, last couple of years as well, uh, we decided, well, the game day producers decided to give me this on a, uh, a holiday segment. This is one of my gifts, which was a Michael Irvin crying emoji <laughs> from his speech on the Dallas Star. And yeah. I just figured what better way to, uh, um, I guess, bring the spirit of my show and my colleagues and my love of football and uh, to your uh, pod than, than rocking this T-shirt, you know? It was, Irvin's speech was one of the best ever. And I do feel like after that, I feel like everyone was like, I got to live up to Michael's speech, right? I, I did feel like there was a thing where like, okay, his was really good. Now I got to make mine better. And yeah. at some point, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not naming names, but at some point you're like, Name them all. They're all their own their, they all go yeah. 35, 40 minutes now. I mean, yeah. my God. Uh, but Michael's was the, the, the one that was done the first time where um, it started later in the afternoon to get a primetime speech in. And Michael's speech was the first one ever done as the sun went down. Yeah, and, um, the anchor leg. He was that, I mean, so it was, it was quite something, but um, even though uh, it's respected and he's, he, I, I couldn't love him more. I mean, he spoke at my daughter's baby naming. He was at my wedding as well. Susie, my wife, worked with him at Fox Sports. She knew him, ran into him in the streets of New York, asked him if he had a tuxedo. He said, yes. She goes, then, then show up in 24 hours. And she gave him the address. And sure enough, he did show up in an electric blue tuxedo. Of course. All of my friends were like, what the hell is Michael Irvin doing at your wedding? And then he spoke at my baby naming uh, for my daughter. Uh, my daughter was seven. I mentioned her in the previous segment. Taylor and she was born. Uh, we actually induced to make sure that she did. She came uh, before the football season. That actually happened. <laughs> um, and so we did it on a. We had a baby naming on a Saturday, so all the game day morning guys were already in town, and they came over to my house. And I remember the rabbi uh, told us. She says to us, "Hey, uh, in my ceremony for the baby naming, we've got uh, one spot for anybody." friend, family to, to speak. Who can that, who is that? And I went home to Susie and I'm like, I know who it's going to be. And she goes, who is it? Michael. And she goes, done. And his speech that he gave at the baby naming about the, you know, fatherhood, this, that, the other thing could not have been more remarkable. And I love him. And that speech was amazing. And yet still, it's one of my favorite t-shirts I have. Um, certainly since he's constantly betting, uh, predicting against my jets every week. And unfortunately for him this year um, and me, um, he was finally wrong at the worst possible time, Trey. So yeah. there's that. So I figure his joy and my misery uh, is why I should wear this shirt on your pod. They run concurrent, uh, apparently. Um, before we get into the actual season, I, I just I want to get one thing on the draft. Is there one guy, because I have someone in mind for me, okay. that, that has gone through the draft and was a huge question mark, you know, for whatever issue, and has turned out to be the exact opposite of what you thought he might be. Like, there's, there's one guy, the reason I bring this up, there's one guy that comes to me, that was, a, I think it was a, taking them the third round, we were still doing it in Radio City, Tyron Matthew out of LSU, oh, yeah. you know. Well, uh, we, we, and, and, but we were told by Dion at the comma yeah. um, that everybody's got this kid wrong. Yeah. And we're like, OK, you know, because um, of everything, the, the honey badger and everything that had gone down at Les Miles program with him. And we're like, OK, Dan, he goes, he goes, no, 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 you don't understand. Like this kid has turned it around. And if anybody passes on him, they're going to make a mistake. And he, Dion was spot on about him. And um, so the fact that he has turned into this uh just leaps to mind about how Dion was giving us that scouting report beforehand. But, you know, I, I, I don't, I mean, 
there, there's so many different stories about, you know, third, fourth, fifth rounders that have blossomed and bloomed um, that you don't know about going into the draft because they, they're not nearly as big a man on campus as obviously Tyron Matthew was coming At in. At LSU. Yeah. Right. So, so, but I, I'll, I'll just stay current right here and just, you know, no question in my mind uh, what Josh Allen has become. Yeah. Nobody saw that, even with the Bills taking him where, where they took him. And the whole concept about him was, oh, yeah, he can throw it 90 yards in the air and he could throw it 90 miles an hour, but he can't hit the side of a barn. And, you know, the Bills have got their hands full. And, man, boy, did they miss out on Josh Rosen and uh, Lamar, who was also on the board at the time. Nobody was sitting there when – you know, um, Darnold went, or even Mayfield, who is playing with his hair on fire right now, as Miles Garrett said. What Allen has become is he's he's an MVP type guy. He's a guy that I don't think even in this knee jerk overreaction league can we sit here right now. And obviously, this may not age well, but you can't sit here and say that guy can't go point for point with Mahomes right now. Yeah, look, right, right now they're playing as well as everybody, as well as anybody is. There's he, no question. It seems that he's gutting, you know, his opponents, that he's stealing their will and their soul right now, that he, when he fades back, he's just, it's a shock that he's taken down or even rushed because he's so efficient and so good and so big and so, so I, I don't even think anybody could have dreamt when he was taken you know, in 2018, that by 2020, three years in, he would be this good. He is that good. No, you're 100% right. He absolutely is. And uh, it, it's been like, it's incredible. Like, I know I was talking to Stink, um, who did his game on Saturday, and he yeah, talked he, about how he just. He's amazing in that game. Yeah. He, well, he just totally, and he's totally reworked his mechanics, which has been absolutely incredible. And that's been, I think, that's, it's not easy to rebuild. It's like rebuilding your golf swing. It's not that easy. And that's why you have the offseason to do it. And he, he's been incredible. But from a, from a bigger perspective here, are you surprised at all that we're almost to the end of the season and we haven't had a game canceled? Because yeah. I can remember thinking about this in July when we're going through training camps and like everyone's wearing those, those alerts, don't get too close, but mm -hmm. blocking and tackling, like how is this going to work? And I know there've been, you can say, well, they did this thing wrong or they did that thing wrong. But to me, the idea that we're this close to the end of the season and we have yet to have a game canceled because of COVID is quite frankly miraculous. It is. It is. And I know there's been a lot of complaints. Um, two games in particular, you know, the uh, Niners losing Kendrick Bourne for Thursday night game against Green Bay. And in the Denver game. Contacts also being out. And so they didn't really have uh, any frontline receivers with their quarterback and tight end already injured and running back already injured and out that they were th severely hamstrung. And obviously, as you point out, that Denver game, but the league came in um, before the season. All of them, uh, all the owners, all agreed that we are not canceling a game if one position group is ravaged. Yep. Um, like say the wide receiver position for San Francisco that night, or obviously the quarterback position. For Denver. They will not do that. If everybody else is healthy and ready to go, if contact tracing, and all of the um, hard work that the medical staff of the NFL and Dr. Alan Sills and his crew, I mean, anybody who, who tests positive for COVID, they've got all the contact tracers, they've got video, they know if you've been wearing your mask or not, where you've been or not, if you've been wearing a contact tracer or not, they know who you've been around, they know if you were outside or inside. I mean, they've, they're able to parse it in a way, nothing is perfect, obviously. Um, but if you're able to find out that the rest of the team can go, you're going. And, um, and the Ravens, after that Thanksgiving game, they couldn't go. They didn't have – it was something that totally it was, was – an It was a constant outbreak, which was the difference right. in this situation. They continually had an outbreak. Everybody on the field, not like you couldn't have excised out the entire position group and gone – they decided that if you could do that, if you could just basically say that the rest of the team is healthy and ready to go, then we're going. But if one team is is so ravaged by the the disease, you couldn't go. And that's what happened 
um, there. That's why sometimes games were pushed from Sunday to Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday because they were able to try and figure out if anybody was, you know, shedding the virus or not. It's, it's, it's an awful, insidious, terrible virus that can affect people in different ways. And they were able to figure out through all this time. We just don't know, obviously, if heaven forbid, AFC Championship, NFC Championship Week, Super Bowl, what happens? I don't, I don't know. Um, but we're close to the end here, and um, I am, or as Gruden, you know, knock on wood, if you're with me, you know, I mean, yeah. so. I'm with you. Uh, yeah, and I always people are like, well, why didn't they do this? To me, I think they were just going to try and get through the regular season, and whatever cushion they needed, we'll use that cushion in the playoffs when it matters most. Because you know that more than anybody else, the crown jewel of sports television are the NFL playoffs. And if we have to, we have to finagle that. We're going to do it there, not in the regular season. Right, I agree. I mean, week eighteen is something that would have to be a total disaster with two or three games um, that had needed to be canceled in one week. That. Because again, if you just say, for instance, that Titans Steelers game in week four that was pushed to, I think, what, week eight, and the Ravens and Steelers were pushed to the week before, all those pieces that'd be moved. Uh, if you just say, screw it, we're not going to mess with that on a schedule, that's now a week 18 game. What happens if, you know, the Steelers had another game canceled? You can't have them play two week 18 games. And I mean, there were so, we, we, I, I literally could take out the rest of your time about all the scenarios that would make something like that thoroughly unworkable. In unless it's in case of extreme emergency, and thank goodness they didn't they didn't uh, have to do anything like that. No, and it's been it's been a remarkable undertaking by the NFL and the NFLPA to get to this spot. So we're here on the cusp of the playoffs, and you know my my preseason prediction, which is almost always useless because I'm like, well, who's getting hurt? That's the first question when I'm making this prediction in August. I mean, tell me who's getting hurt, and we'll figure that out. But I had the Chiefs and the Saints in the Super Bowl. Um, and I, I will say, I, I guess at this point, I, I kind of favor Green Bay in the NFC, but I, I don't feel like there's any team in the NFC where you can just say, oh, yeah, all in on these guys. I get it. But I, I'm, I would be shocked, Rich, still to this day, if, if, we're, not seeing, uh, if we're not seeing that Kansas City team uh, raising that uh, Lombardi trophy again. Yeah, the way to beat – the way that, you know, I mean, I'm not telling any tales out of school here. you got to limit yeah. – Mahomes' possessions. You got to limit Mahomes' possessions, and if you're fortunate in one of the possessions, you turn them over. Yep. So um, that's what you have to do. And who can do that? You know, obviously, a team with a great running game can do that, and a team with a defense that's opportunistic that can rush the passer and get some sort of pressure on him. And if you got the corners to cover, or um, you know, the unicorn on defense that can actually cover the unicorn at tight end that they have and, and Travis right. who's on a hall of fame career path now um that then then all the better and I look around and I'm like which teams can do this well the Titans obviously have Derrick Henry yep. um and they do have a quarterback that can play action and throw deep balls to you know a beast of a receiver and AJ Brown they do have that and also the history of of having played Kansas City in Kansas City in a game like this. You also have the Browns, um, obviously, with the running attack that they have. And Mayfield, if he doesn't make the mistakes, uh, like the second half of the season, uh, Miles Garrett, Olivier Vernon, uh, the back end of that defense can maybe um, come up with something. But, you know, obviously, they don't have the history or, um, or anybody who's been there and done that before. So, I mean, we could sit here and talk about the Ravens, but the Chiefs appear to have the Ravens number. Correct. Uh, could sit here and say the Colts potentially. Um, I, I, but the Bills, again, and Josh Allen, um, he's so amazing. And the defenses are kind of similar. I had Rod Woodson on my show just this week, and he's just like, neither of them are, house, you know, lighten it up. But uh, some of them, you know, both, both these defenses can turn people over. So, I agree with you. I think Kansas City goes. And um, and in the NFC, I mean, minute you think the Rams or the Rams are going to be doing Oh, my it, God. Yeah. Go in and do that. But then you could see what they can also do otherwise outside of those games. You've got, obviously, Seattle um, with an opportunity. I, I'm, I'm assuming the Bucs will be a tough out just because it's team. Boy, they are very frustrating to watch this year, right? It's but, like a pendulum team. But if they do actually sort of – start to put it together I'm like oh my gosh they're they they have everybody who's been there and done that um you know at crucial positions whether it's the quarterback and 
the tight end or obviously Arians and the coach. Uh, Todd Bowles as well has been there through a lot of the wars with with Arians. The rest of them are are kind of new to everything, but there's still TV 12 in this mix. Uh, you know, I, 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 I look at them and I, I have no idea if Arizona can put it all together, but man, Kyler Murray and DeAndre Hopkins are a one-two punch. And Hassan Reddick is filling the role that Chandler Jones vacated by being out. But when it all comes down to it, I mean, Aaron Rodgers playing at such a high level um, and they may have the home field that goes through there. Um, the Saints are uh, a team that I hopped on as a, um, an audible uh, mulligan that I took on, on game day morning around Thanksgiving. I did have the Ravens and the, um, and the Bucks going in uh, to the season, and then I switched to, to the Saints and the, um, and the Chiefs. Yeah. We'll see, but it's going to be yeah. dynamite, man. I'm excited for it. It is, and, and I'll, I'll just leave it at this. I think this might be the best young group of quarterbacks we've seen in a long time in the NFL. I mean, we have 10 or 12 guys that can absolutely light it up, so the next decade should be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, we're, we're lucky, and then in comes Trevor. You know, yeah. we'll see where he winds up. Jacksonville, Jets, Jets. By the way, Jacksonville, real quickly, uh, they, they're, they're so close to matching – what only the 2001 Carolina Panthers did win week one and then lose 15 straight. Well, I think that's almost worse than going 0 and 16 because you had a taste and then it all went south. It's interesting that you, you say that Trey, because the 2001 Carolina Panthers are the only one in 15 team in, in, in a Super Bowl era, common draft yeah. history uh, that did not get the first overall pick despite finishing one in 15. And the reason why is because, the Houston Texans automatically had the first overall pick in the next year's draft because they were Correct. the expansion, expansion team. team. So yeah. the Houston Texans made it sure, made everyone know because of what was going on that the Carolina Panthers knew going into the season that even if they were finishing so horribly, they were had no shot at the number one draft choice. Thus the Jets and Jaguars, whoever loses out, will be the first ever one in 15 team in the common draft era. To, uh, to not get the number one overall selection. It is truly um, uh, a shit sandwich that somebody will be swallowing whole. And we, I think, know which fan base that's going to be right here, right now. J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. I don't wish to date your pod at all, but yeah, um, yeah I think that's the way it's gonna be. And, uh, too happy about it. Yeah. Well, if anyone knows how to swallow a shit sandwich, it would be the Jets. There, there's no question about that. Listen, Rich, I appreciate your time, brother. It's always good to catch up. Ah. Um, be well, be safe. And in the immortal words of Alec Baldwin, mazel mazel, good things. Same to you, sir. And I'll, I'd love to have you on in January. Let's talk some ball on my show and let's keep this thing going. Let's do it, brother. Be well, be safe. You, buddy.